25, 22, 325 p.m. October 29th, Saturday. Part three. Calling this one the Owsley. It's the Owsley Stanley. <laughs> senator's grandson. Not a senator's son, but Senator's grandson. Owsley Stanley. Air Force veteran. And uh, the legendary guy who was in the basement mixing up the medicine, supposedly. Although, is that really what happened? I heard it was the uh, Swiss Sandoz Corporation. And reverse engineering by Eli Lilly. Perfecting or approximating the uh, formula. The famous formula for you know who. <laughs> they who must not be named. Except we will name them in this program. We're going to talk about the CIFA quite a bit. Either Actually, actually that'll slop over into the next program, because I think this is going to go for two more hours. So enjoy. <laughs> it's the 29th. We tried doing this 20 days ago, which was five days after the first Two monologues were taped, and uh, that week, and actually for the last several weeks, Seattle has been experiencing the worst air quality in the world. We were uh, off and on number one and two with Portland, and boy, oh boy, it really did do a number on me and just about everybody else. I mean, you walk a block or two in this stuff, and... You get a sort of heartburn, but not that digestive heartburn, but a terrible feeling in your lungs. And I just noticed, hadn't thought of it, but I, I, there's this like uh, 12 foot by 12 foot grate that we're right next to here, which is where they're grating out, venting out the uh, automobile exhaust from parking facility at this place. And we have discussed this place before. So, uh, part three, and uh, I, you know, we should just begin by uh, reiterating the uh, term extemporaneous composition, which is what we're experimenting with here. And so, uh, in terms of correcting the errata from uh, parts one and two, the biggest uh, glitch really was a literary one, and that is uh, Eugene O'Neill. I guess this proves it was extemporaneous because uh, his actual last words didn't include. <laughs> God damn it! Uh, they're 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 being typically quoted as I knew it, whispering I knew it, I knew it born in a hotel room died in a hotel room so glad we got that right 
Uh, there were a few issues about uh, Taylor Hawkins died about 10 days before the 28th anniversary of Kurt Cobain. If uh, at any point I said 27 years, it, it wasn't quite 28 years, but within 10 days, oddly enough, we'll get into that. Uh, Donald Camel, the uh, film director, did not have much of a career in Hollywood. He was a Brit. He died in 1996 at age 62 by shotgun. Apparently, you know, we're not endorsing that, but uh, I, I may have communicated the idea that he died uh, after his film failed to get immediate release, his performance film, and that uh, didn't actually was shot in 68 or released in the in Britain in 68 and then was delayed, but apparently did get released in 1970. Uh, great gangster film. Rock and roll gangster film. Uh, Chrissy Hind, I may have said that she made these statements about women dressing provocatively. Shocking statements. That occurred in 2015, not the last couple of years, which is the sort of thing I, I think I did say. The uh, Superstars of the 70s compilation, which I heard as a kid, uh, included Taxi and Woodstock by Joni Mitchell. Did not include those other two tunes I was describing, so that was an error we regret. Stuart Copeland was born in Alexandria, Virginia, USA, then as a little kid moved to uh, Lebanon and I think also Egypt, then on to private school in uh, Jolly Old, so we got that about 90% right, but uh, born in the USA. Uh, the, 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 the most startling one that you may have caught was, uh, and, and this I do sort of blame on the really terrible air quality, is I just sputtered out melody when I meant medley. I know what a medley is, I know what a melody is, but twice there in one or two sentences I said melody when I meant medley. The Beatles medley from Abbey Road is what I was talking about. Uh, oh, and further on Joni Mitchell, I described uh, the uh, attribution, the um, subject matter of, of her Free Man of Paris song as being around for 50 years, that this has been known that it was about you-know-who for 50 years. The record came out 48 years ago, so almost on target there. And the Aurora Beacon News, founded in 1846, not 1843, as I previously stated. <laughs> we de deeply regret the error. And by the way, uh, you know, when I worked for them for two weeks, I was paid about 10 cents an hour because it was actually... Now, these are, these, these are for fascist-leaning ultra-conservatives <laughs> that were mixed up with the uh, CIFA. And, uh... CI fucking A. And uh, they were paying me about 10 cents an hour because I had to do collections, and then I had to turn my collections money in at the end of the uh, week. For these two weeks, I worked for them. And I made about 10 cents an hour, I vividly remember. Then I moved to another company and delivered those other three papers in the same territory and was paid about 50 cents an hour, maybe 75 cents on a good day. Did that seven days a week, all kinds of weather, 365 days a year for like more than two years. Child labor in the journalism business. And then on to a more serious subject, uh, which is the death of Chris Cornell, which is not really the focus of what we're doing here, uh, but we have made some commentary about it. And uh, just to let you know, first of all, uh, well, the controversies continue. Uh, Cornell's widow uh, got headlines in 2018, the year following his death saying that it was a botched homicide investigation. She hired her own expert who said that this was a matter of, quote, synergistic depressant activity 
that would cause significant motor and mental impairment. And this specifically had to do with prednisone, a steroid that uh, the Wayne County coroner did not test for, for whatever reason. Uh, the media or someone consulted with the, the famous Dr. Wecht, and he said, well, you still could not call that the cause of death, because after all, it was a hanging by exercise band, or more specifically, we'll call it strangulation by exercise band, because why go along with the uh, official verdict? Also, uh, he was performing with Soundgarden, and you know, this kind of uh, confused me uh, during the extemporaneous uh, relating of details because you know, those guys were not in any of the news coverage, but he was touring with the band. Uh, one commentator, uh, one observer in Detroit said, Matt Cameron, Kim Thale, and Ben Shepard didn't back off their instruments. Meaning they were hard driving even though allegedly uh, Mr. Cornell was not. He was not having a great night on stage. It is said by many. Although, you know, watch the videotape and decide for yourself on that. It was not like a disaster or anything. Crowd was wildly bordering on wildly enthusiastic Detroit Rock City, you know. And, uh... But, uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, Cameron, Mr. Cameron, Matt Cameron, then of Soundgarden, now of uh, Pearl Jam, four months later he finally makes a statement to the press, quote, we're all still processing our grief in our own way and in our own time. Yeah. In our own time. You know, we just, we'll just let people hang. We won't make any uh, statements at all. They let it go for four months, and that was about all he said, apparently. This guy knows how to handle the media, which is something we're going to get into uh, immediately, really, uh, which is to uh, discuss Mr. Cameron and Mr. Smith and their handling of their positions as media superstars and how they're sort of pretending that they don't know that when you talk to a reporter from the Rolling Stone magazine after the death of a very famous person they're going to want some details that are going to play into uh, some kind of interpretation as to what really went on. Why did this person die? How did this person die? How could they not understand that? And so uh, this is uh, what we uh, oh, and before we launch into that how awkward. Uh, we left off at the end of the last monologue. Again, I'm going to blame the air quality, but uh, we, we kind of uh, fudged this and, and didn't even realize it. The quote from David Grohl uh, in the Los Angeles Taylor Hawkins tribute concert was, quote, and you know, we started working on putting both of these shows together a long, long time ago. What a curious thing to say. And we finally got the uh, quotation right there. But, um, you know, the, the concert was announced in, uh, I believe, uh, simultaneously with uh, a statement by Taylor Hawkins' widow and a, a posting by the Foo Fighters on May 8th that they were going to move forward with these... Uh, tribute concerts and obviously Rolling Stone got real impatient because uh, you know they had waited uh, about seven weeks uh, for further clarification from those uh, forensic science experts in the uh, big laboratory in Colombia Bogota, and uh, they, they got nothing, despite those very American-sounding assurances that we will be providing additional details as they become available, right? But here we are. Uh, that was March 25th. Uh, here we are, the 29th of October, so we're past the seven-month mark. And no details, no cause of death. 
And, you know, I saw a recent, uh, I think it was New York Post in the last few days, and they're just calling it an overdose, died of an overdose. And this is because there were 10 substances in his uh, system found, and, uh, however, lots of people have those substances in their systems. What was the cause of death? None of them were stated as being uh, present in overdose quantities. And so was it the fact that his heart was twice the size of a normal male heart at 600 grams? As I said before, that, uh, cause, you know, uh, circumstances in a death case, I've never heard of that before. How could a person's heart be twice that size? It just brings to mind all kinds of exotic chemistry that doesn't uh, have anything to do with, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals that are commonly prescribed to Americans or opioids, or THC, or cocaine uh, was apparently not among the 10 substances listed right there in the middle of the cocaine uh, center of the universe, Bogota, Colombia. And, uh, but according to one report, there was a cocaine-like white substance, uh, you know, on the coffee table or whatever, although that is not confirmed by police. The, the police or the medical examiner there also didn't confirm the 600 grams of heart, which it should have weighed in at about 300 grams. So uh, what the, the Rolling Stone has, and we're just going to clue you in on the basic premise of what we're going to say here uh, whilst we read, before we read through uh, all of the specifics, both of these parties cannot be telling the truth. If Rolling Stone uh, quoted these people, uh, meaning specifically Mr. Matt Cameron of Pearl Jam and Mr. Uh, Chad Smith of Red Hot Chili Peppers, if they're quoting uh, these guys accurately and there's really no reason to believe that they are not, then they're saying things about Taylor Hawkins and his relationship with David Grohl that the David Grohl management, not himself, but their spokesperson, unspecified spokesperson, is denying completely, which is really astonishing. One of these two parties is lying, or there's one po other possibility, which is that both of them are lying. And the most difficult part about that is that that would uh, involve a rather high-level, you know, spiracy between all of these parties. And at this particular point, I'm leaning toward uh, seeing uh, spiracy as uh, the most likely cause of the glaring discrepancies uh, between the versions of uh, what Mr. Hawkins said about basically wanting to quit the Foo Fighters. So the, the uh, secondary headline here, inside the main headline, inside Taylor Hawkins' final day as a Foo Fighter, the legendary drummer went all out for the band he loved, but in the months before he died on tour, Hawkins told multiple friends he, quote, couldn't fucking do it anymore. And the really gnarly thing about this is, it's not clear in this story why he couldn't do it anymore. He's not overtly stating, according to uh, Smith uh, or Cameron or anyone else, that he had a physical disability that was preventing him from doing it anymore. And he's not stating, it's not stated in the way that they, they quote, uh, Smith and Cameron and the other parties here, that he was saying that he did it out of resentment toward Grohl for some reason. It's basically conveyed that he didn't like the heavy touring. But because uh, Grohl is undoubtedly paying him on a per-appearance basis, there's no reason to believe otherwise, the, the, the more big venues he did, the more money he would make. Although he claimed, you know, on at least one occasion that being in the Foo Fighters had made him rich, you know, quote-unquote rich, but 
that doesn't answer all the questions. What what does make sense to me, but you know, I would have to see this fleshed out with additional quotations, is that he was maintaining this relationship with these other drummers, not just because they wanted to trade some uh, trade secrets on, you know, what sticks and uh, skins they preferred. He, he could have been asking them about uh, availability of lead-off dates and what level of compensation that Pearl Jam or the Chili Peppers could provide to him and uh, how enthusiastic they might be about taking him on as a lead-off act with one of his side projects. Because, you know, if Grohl wasn't paying him sufficiently, then the idea would be he could make just as much money as a lead-off act for these big, big bands and enhance his uh, career prospects as a solo artist. And isn't that really what David Grohl, you know, more or less claims that he always wanted to break away from Cobain and uh, Nirvana? Now, he gives various interpretations and explanations for this. But obviously, since he's had such a big, big solo career, he has to maintain this idea that those songs are inside him just waiting to get out, and uh, he would have deprived the world of his uh, brilliant songwriting and band-leading abilities had he not broken loose uh, from the Cobain band. So why wouldn't he grant the same privilege to Taylor Hawkins? Well, obviously the answer to that is, as uh, one of the uh, drummers says in this article, he was half their show, you know, being up there on the bandstand, very, very energetically playing. That's something that uh, added a great deal of interest to these aged tunes that Mr. Grohl was playing. And we'll get into that uh, in this hour, which is that uh, Grohl is playing the same material that he has been playing uh, nonstop since uh, 1996, starting... Uh, on Mercer Street, right over yonder, you know, like uh, maybe a half a mile or a mile over that way, I think on this side of the freeway, uh, the first Foo Fighters gig at that uh, Marine Supply Store. And those tunes were written in October of 94, largely, so it is written. So he's been playing these same old tunes, he's an older guy. He seems to be on hormone replacement therapy or involved in steroid abuse, as most of these burly, uh, beefy Foo Fighters guys appear to be. Although, you know, Hawkins was their youthful appearing, slender, Iggy Pop like uh, character up there on the, the bandstand, up there on the drum stage. And, uh, and you know, you may realize that. Uh, he even had an acting role for which he received some acclaim uh, in a movie, 2013 CBGB, uh, which was a sort of uh, getting actors to lip sync, largely. That, that, that's what's claimed. I mean, it was a legitimate, it was a mix of lip sync and actual performance, I think is what it was, of people pretending that, <laughs> actors pretending that they're these musicians that appeared at the legendary punk club in New York and... Uh, Hawkins played Iggy Pop, who actually never appeared at CBGB. <laughs> I'm not sure he ever stepped foot in the place. So it was that kind of movie. It's sort of meeting market demand without actually being too accurate at all. But uh, so uh, Hawkins will uh, sort of be remembered in history for uh, a photo that was taken three days before his death with a girl who I think was nine years old and she was a drummer and she waited outside the hotel with hundreds of other fans and so he's uh, posing very happily with her and she's elated at meeting her rock and roll hero. Three days later, Rolling Stone writes, he was dead. An official cause of death is still unknown. And seven months later it still is, which is why the New York Post and anyone saying he died of an overdose is wrong. Not officially. 
So Rolling Stone interviewed about 20 people, they say 20 people, and uh, Hawkins felt hesitant about returning to the road and wasn't sure he'd be able to remain a full-time member if they continued to tour at this post, at this pace, these friends say. Although he kept himself in decent shape. Vexed by the physicality, the Hawkins family declined to comment. So did he have a physical problem? Vexed by the physicality doesn't say, I'm under the care of a cardiologist, I'm in drug rehab, I'm trying to quit ciggies, which I haven't seen any photos of him smoking ciggies in recent years. And the Foo Fighters and their management did not want to be interviewed, but through a representative, they dispute Hawkins' friend's characterization of how he was feeling. And this is Matt Cameron, Pearl Jam drummer. He had a heart-to-heart -heart with Dave. Yeah, he told me he, quote, couldn't fucking do it anymore, end quote. Those were his words, says Matt Cameron. A close friend of Hawkins for decades. He recorded music with him. So they did come to some understanding, but it seems like the touring schedule got even crazier after that. A rep for Foo Fighters denies that Hawkins ever raised these issues. Quote, no, there was never a heart-to-heart -heart or any sort of meeting on this topic with Dave and Silva Arg Artist Management. And then this very generic quote, Honestly, I think he was so tired, Hawkins' longtime friend and former boss, singer Jassas Jordan says, tired of the whole game. Well, you know, if they, it's very hard to believe. If she said that, and then she said, that's all I'm saying on this subject, they should have included that. Otherwise, they should have elaborated on having her say what the tired of the whole game really meant. So, and by quoting Rolling Stone magazine at length in this monologue, I'm not endorsing their point of view. If they are aware of all these different uh, issues surrounding the death of Taylor Hawkins, and they're just picking and choosing tiny little quotations to make the whole thing uh, more confusing than ever, then I would say, you know... <laughs> third party in the spiracy. Are they going to sit on the actual content of these interviews forever? Apparently so. Uh, as we'll say at the end of, of this part of this, uh, they haven't responded to the denials by Cameron and Smith. So, he had to take a year working up the courage, uh, the guts, to talk to uh, David Grohl about this. That's so strange. A rep for Foo Fighters says, he never informed Dave and management of anything like that. Yet another denial. And there's an anonymous friend who says uh, that he was just going to do a couple of shows. But the Foo Fighters respond, you know, through their anonymous spokesperson, that he had already known that they were booked for 60 more shows for 2022. The anonymous uh, spokesperson says that there was definitely no limit on the number of concerts Hawkins agreed to play. Quote, the touring schedule had been established and in place for well over a year. And, you know, frankly, they did have almost entirely 18 months off uh, due to COVID, so these issues should have been straightened out. It seems like such a phony baloney issue. He tried to keep up, Cameron says. He just did whatever it took to keep up, and in the end, he couldn't keep up. Why? <laughs> Heart disease, drug addiction, resentment toward his boss, David Grohl. Why couldn't he keep up? And there was this issue about someone losing consciousness aboard a plane to Abu Dhabi, which resulted in a cancellation of a gig there. Chad Smith says, quote, he was dehydrated and all kinds of stuff. 
the Foo Fighters uh, spokesperson says, this is not true. After the incident, Smith says Hawkins told him, I can't do it like this anymore. <laughs> you mean dehydrating yourself? It's ridiculous for anyone to accept this as anything other than so contradictory between the three parties, the Foo Fighters, the collective musicians commenting on this, and the Rolling Stone. According to Rolling Stone, forensic doctors reportedly claim that Hawkins' heart weighed at least 600 grams, about double the normal size. Results of any official autopsy are not yet public. And they uh, quote his uh, Chad Hawkins, his uh, Chad Ward Hawkins drum tech for about 15 years, saying that he started, uh, that he had swapped the place that drugs held in his life for mountain biking. And as we stated in, in, the, in the previous episode here, Hawkins denied last year in an audio taped recording with Rolling Stone that he had any kind of drug issues except seeing himself occasionally chilling out on the beach and uh, smoking a doobie. That's all he had to say about that except, of course, he said, fuck that shit, fuck that shit twice in addressing any issue that he would perform in an intoxicated state, and he has no reputation of doing so. And, you know, oddly, uh, this Chad Smith character from the Red Hot Chili Peppers seems to have been instrumental in pressuring uh, the widow along, Hawkins' widow, to appear at one of their shows at the at Jazz Fest in New Orleans. Uh, he made a statement on April 29th, before the widow had said anything at all, in Billboard, April 29th, we're taking Alice and his wife with us, and it's going to be a celebration. That's what she wants. She doesn't want to be it to be anything other than let's celebrate our friends, let's celebrate Taylor. This is what he would want, and he would be very happy that you guys are playing, and he would want it to be nothing but a positive experience. So we're going to do all that, and I'm honored that we can do that with her. We're going to play our hearts out. So this is before the two tribute concerts were announced, and this is a warm-up. You know, about... Get a muffler! Get 35 bufflers! Location shooting. See what he's doing there? Talk about putting words in someone's mouth. <laughs> the widow has not said word one uh, about the death of her husband, the mysterious and unexplained death of her husband. Uh, but uh, Chad Smith of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, a band with a trail of bodies behind it, you know, as we mentioned, River Phoenix seems to have been potentially the uh, persistent belief among some is that he uh, may have received a fatal dose at Johnny Depp's nightclub from uh, John Frisconti of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And they had another guy die in their band, uh, Hillel Slovak, in their early years. Uh, this guy wants another, uh, another body on his trail of bodies? That seems uh, like an odd role for this character in history, doesn't it? sticking his nose in like that, speaking for the widow when she hasn't spoken for herself. And then he, uh, he, you know, he appeared at this concert 
and he was quoted as saying that she was here. In fact, he was quoted as saying the whole family is here, meaning the whole Hawkins family is here. They traveled from L.A. to New Orleans under his pressure to appear at his concert. There are no photos of this. Uh, and and uh, he was quoted as saying the whole family, but in the audio, the video, he sort of slurs that or, or mumbles it, so it's not really clear, but the press quoted him as saying the Hill family. What a strange, garish thing to do. <laughs> you know, insist that his whole family comes out to endorse your appearance in New Orleans when uh, they're still sizing up their whole situation back home. And Grohl was supposedly there as well, but he uh, did not appear on stage. And then according to witnesses and Grohl himself, he was there, or at least he was in the same city at the same time attending a Preservation Hall event with Pete Townsend of the Hue. Haven't seen any photos of that either. He was merely in the audience. So, the important thing, uh, we, you know, we've gone through most of the uh, key assertions here. Do not call one of his friends a Mr. Watts, says... Uh, do not call Taylor Hawkins a drummer, Watts says. He was a musician. He was amazing at the guitar, amazing at piano. He understood bass. So obviously he's fully capable of doing what David Grohl has supposedly done, which is uh, leap into his own recording career, regardless of uh, backing musicians needing to be secured. Taylor knew he didn't have it in him, an anonymous friend says, and he was trying to deliver. Quoting uh, his old friend Sass Jordan, Oh my fucking God, I look at the goddamn tour schedule, it gives me anxiety. Anxiety is not the reason to kill yourself. Playing 60 dates in front of millions of people after a year and a half of uh, chilling out. Smith also says, Mr. Smith of the Chili Peppers, that was one of the straws that broke the camel's back about this Abu Dhabi incident where Hawkins supposedly collapsed on a plane in a stopover in Chicago. And uh, Mr. Cameron rings in with uh, the quotation that we referred to previously. Taylor was half their show. Smith, uh, according to Rolling Stone, actually called them wanting to talk about it. And by the end of the interview, he was sobbing so hard he could barely get the words out. He called them. But a day or two after the publication online by Rolling Stone, we get this. Many headlines along these lines. Matt Cameron and Chad Smith distance themselves from misleading Foo Fighters article. Matt Cameron has apologized after remarks about Taylor Hawkins appeared out of context. Quote, unquote. While Chad Smith calls the story, quote, sensationalized and misleading. The band's management reacted to both stories, saying that the meeting described by Cameron never took place and that Smith's depiction of events was not true. Now both drummers have walked back their remarks. Quote, when I agreed to take part in the Rolling Stone article about Taylor, I assumed it would be a celebration of his life and work, Matt Cameron posted on Instagram. My quotes were taken out of context and shaped into a narrative I never intended. 
I am truly sorry to have taken part in this interview, and I apologize that my participation may have caused harm to those for whom I have only the deepest respect and admiration. Especially Dave Grohl is obviously what's implied there. And for Mr. Smith, Taylor was one of my best friends and I would do anything for his family, said Smith. I was asked by Rolling Stone to share some memories of our time together, which I thought was going to be the loving tribute he deserved, although the loving tribute appeared already in paper form and uh, online. They did a two-page spread in the magazine weeks before this came out, which, as I've said, is only online, actually. I apologize to his family and musical friends for any pain this may have caused. I miss Taylor every day. So, glad we got through that. It, you know, it is the major... I mean, this is like when uh, Cobain died and there was this article called The Downward Spiral by her buddy, uh, by uh, CLC's buddy, uh, Neil Strauss. Or eventually he became her buddy. And uh, the downward spiral is like, you know, the definitive article on uh, the last days of Kurt Cobain. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to reiterate the details here. It's more important to realize that this Neil Strauss guy is uh, a scandal monger supreme. In fact, he, uh, as far as I know, he, he did, I, I even called the New York Times, and they said, we do not employ... Mr. Neil Strauss any longer, and we will not uh, count him among our reporters in the future, was uh, basically what they said. And this was apparently due to uh, fallout he should have expected by witnessing uh, Mr. Uh, Marilyn Manson, uh, Brian Warner, his real name, sexually assaulting a teenager and then just being the objective reporter uh, who sits there and watches it occurring <laughs> rather than picking up the phone and, you know, calling LAPD and saying this guy's doing a sexual assault on a teenager. And he reported this as if he had no responsibility beyond the objective reporter witnessing uh, this apparent felony crime. And, you know, as far as our experience with Neil Strauss, I spoke to Neil Strauss a few days after Cobain died, he was still in Seattle. Neil Strauss is actually the first person to ever say on uh, audio tape right into uh, one of our camcorders that uh, people say he was murdered, referring to Cobain. So I got that tape on him right here at Seattle Center, and then a few days uh, later, you know, let's call it a couple of days later before he cut town, I said, what are you doing about this whole murder angle? And uh, he didn't have a whole lot to say. Uh, I guess he was non-committal. A lot of these guys seem to uh, refer to the folks back in New York, the editors, uh, as uh, many corporate journalists do. But uh, as far as uh, being interested in any uh, possibility of anything other than suicide... That was not the story that Neil Strauss wanted to tell, and he became very celebrated as the central article on Cobain's death, appearing not only in Rolling Stone magazine, but a few months later they came out with that hardback book compiling uh, many of their stories on Cobain, and again, his article, The Downward Spiral, was the centerpiece. So, uh, speaking of onstage banter, we referred to Mr. Smith's onstage banter, claiming that the whole family, uh, the Hawkins family, was there under his uh, extraordinary pressure, even though that may not be true. And it was an interesting bit of uh, banter about pizza that we'll refer to. 
Yes, I said pizza. So, uh, you know, the, the foos get up there on stage and... Uh, the final show. Buenos Aires, March 20th. David Grohl, Taylor, do you love it? Hawkins, I fucking love playing big fucking huge stadiums in Buenos Aires. David Grohl, it's pretty fun. I like it too. You know, the best fucking thing about ha Taylor Hawking, he's the best fucking drummer in the world. We love him so much. That fucker can sing. I fuck Taylor Hawkins. I fucking love Dave Grohl, man. I'd be delivering pizzas if it weren't for fucking Dave Grohl. I'd be managing the drum department at a guitar center if it wasn't for fucking Dave Grohl. And the oddest thing about this is that uh, he had previously, obviously previously, if this is his last show, but uh, a few years ago he appeared at the Billboard Music Women in Music Icon Award, uh, introducing an award for Alanis Morissette, uh, who did give him his first really big break of uh, touring for about a year and a half in her band and he said rather nervously you know I don't normally give speeches I play drums for a living one of the reasons I play drums for a living is because I'm an amazing woman who's here tonight I think I can see you Alanis Morissette I've said it before and I'll say it again um, I would probably be delivering pizzas to someone you know tonight if it weren't for her I mean it she gave me a break and uh, she was awesome. She was an amazing boss. And you see the problem there, which is... Uh, this is standardized stage banter. So, you know, for all I know, this was uh, a bit of banter they did dozens of times or hundreds of times. And it seems to be undeniably plagiarized from something that Mr. Hawkins had uh, authored referring to his uh, first band leader boss, Alanis Morissette, and David Grohl said, yeah, you know that thing you said uh, about the pizza delivery? Why don't you say that about me, that I'm the one who pulled you out of nowhere and gave you a career, even though he had, you know, he, had a, he was in the Sass Jordan band previously uh, also. And so uh, there, you, there you have David Grohl insisting on a false attribution of... I picked you up out of obscurity when you were a nobody. You'd be delivering pizzas if it weren't for me. Now get up there on stage and say that. And even if uh, Hawkins acceded to this, it's still plagiaristic. <laughs> Girls should realize he's in the music biz. Plagiarism is generally not a good idea. And, you know, further on the subject of a dialogue between Mr. Grohl and Mr. Hawkins, they appeared on the Jimmy Kimmel Show. In what is a very, very creepy uh, appearance, in retrospect, I saw it You know, on the on the night that it first aired, and it was super creepy then, and it's even creepier now uh, because of the untimely demise, obviously. Kimmel, it was the two Kimmel. David Grohl says. It was kind of my idea. This is about Studio 666, the movie in which he murders the whole band in very uh, graphic and horrible detail. It was kind of my idea, yes. It was my idea that we would make a movie where the band moves into a creepy old house, starts making a record, the house is haunted, I become possessed, I murder the whole band and go solo. Kimmel. Now, when he pitched this fantasy that he had, was anyone concerned? Taylor Hawkins, 
I was just wondering if this meant something. Kimmel, yeah, right. Taylor Hawkins, you know. Kimmel, do you still... Do, do you... Th what do you think after making the movie that it... Do you think after making the movie that it meant something? Taylor Hawkins, I'm still not sure. David Grohl, we survived. Look at us. We're still the Foo Fighters. Kimmel, yeah, you're all alive. That's good. That's a plus. So, uh, in case you're not familiar at all with the uh, Studio 666 movie, they appeared about a week before the opening, and the official opening was February 25th. And, you know, this is a movie wherein exactly this happens. David Grohl becomes... Let's say Dave Grohl, the character Dave Grohl, becomes possessed by a demon in this house and then uh, very gruesomely uh, slaughters the whole Foo Fighters family one by one. They all die of head wounds or neck wounds, strangely enough. And, you know, this is unprecedented. They, they uh, no other rock band has done a horror film like this. I think in some of the publicity, they compared this to an old movie from the 70s called uh, Kiss Saves Christmas, I think it's called. So you got the Kiss guys in their makeup running around, interacting with Santa Claus and kids and all that. It's really a ridiculous movie. But it's a rock band in a ridiculous movie. This is really very different. It's a hybrid between a that sort of rock umentary type exposure for the band and pure graphic horror and an element of comedy. And now it's going to go down in history as really something else. Uh, and such weird details involving this... Uh, Someone has figured out that the movie was released... Now, it's called Studio 666, so it's not weird or stupid to be bringing these issues up. The movie was released 660 months and six days after Kurt Cobain was born. 660 months and six days. And it was released to 2,000 screens. Now, strictly speaking, it, I, I use something called the time calculator on line, and it comes out actually to 660 months and five days. But you could say that the opening weekend was, according to this, 660 plus six. Which I, I have to imagine is deliberate. Also, very weirdly, the same website. I did not come up with this concept, by the way, just to be perfectly clear. But the same website points out something that I had never noticed before, which is that uh, Kurt Cobain was born 9,909 days before April 8th, the day that his body was discovered, which in a sense is his death date. 900 and 9,909, which turn it upside down, and you've got uh, three out of the four digits there are sixes. Now, that could be a pure coincidence. It's really hard to imagine that the uh, scheduling of the movie, given its title, does not refer to Kurt Cobain in this way. That's why it was scheduled that way, right? And, you know, was there any other scheduling going on? Uh, it was it released on February 25th, exactly one month before Hawkins' death. And on that date, March 25th, uh, Grohl released uh, what's considered an EP with eight songs. And this was to coincide, you know, a month later, strangely, a month later, with the release of the movie, but actually it coincides with the date of the death of Taylor Hawkins in Bogota, a center of intrigue and uh, murder, no doubt. 
Uh, in fact, the, the district where uh, Hawkins died is in some ways an upscale district. I mean, they've got their own Four Seasons Hotel there. That's where they were staying. But also, prostitution is uh, legal or tolerated uh, just about everywhere in Colombia. And drug dealing, too, of course, although the drug dealers fight for territory. And that particular district of Bogota uh, has been cited in recent years as a place where the gangs are fighting uh, in, in a way that involves what they call chop houses, right? Like uh, Satriales and the Sopranos, right? In fact, I saw this clip a few days ago. Uh, the character Christopher, the, the young guy who's like halfway into the music business as a producer, he says, it's going to be a long time before I eat anything from Satriales again. Because he's right there at the Satriales butcher shop meat. Uh, counter uh, chopping up Richie April, I think is the guy's name. And the same thing goes on in this district of Colombia. In fact, what they do is they chop up the bodies and then they distribute the parts around uh, Bogota in parks and other locations just to make it uh, perfectly clear how easy it is to get away with murder just the way they want to. And this dream, the, the EP, by the way, is called Dream Widow. You would think that if there's one word in the English language that David Grohl does not want to hear, it would be widow. That's the word he's been running from for the last 28 years, isn't it? Does not want any more association with widow than he possibly has to. Supposedly, they've been feuding although there's much evidence to contradict the concept of a feud as well. Anyway, Dream Widow is like this pure Satan rock. It's being described as uh, heavy metal thrash. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, heavy metal with... Uh, well, I, I won't even have to imitate the voice, because if I recite some of the lyrics, you'll, you'll remember what, what that Satan-voiced rock sounds like. Here's one song. Come All Ye Unfaithful. I'm the baby on the black mass altar. I'm the descendant of the jackal. I'm the sick heretic. So it's these sing-songy uh, lyrics that uh, have a lot of authentic meter that your high school English teacher might approve of, but in fact, it's sung in that uh, characteristic, cliched, Heavy metal, speed metal, Satan voice. And here, here's a, a bigger chunk of the lyrics. No way to silence the screaming, deafening voices from hell, carving your skull to completion, leaving you nothing but shell. Cower in total surrender, give in and yield to his name, abandon to wicked seduction, agony, torment, and strain. So, you know, th this is not, this is Spinal Tap, you know? I mean, just, just to verify this, I looked at a couple of, you know, audio and video clips of uh, the Spinal Tap comedy band back when they were a hot thing, man, years ago, obviously. For those of you who are not aware, they actually came along before GNR, Guns and Roses, and GNR stole their whole bit, only uh, they weren't kidding, you know? All of those stupid rock and roll cliches. And so here you have David Grohl indulging in uh, stupid Satan rock cliches. Although it's really just an iteration of all of these cliches, there's nothing that strikes you as, as being at all funny about it. Uh, nothing like... Uh, What's that line? How could I leave her behind? <laughs> it's their ode to uh, Big Bottom Gal songs, right? This is Spinal Tap. The man Spinal Tap. So, you know, I, I know what funny is. That, that's overtly funny. It, it passes the, the stink test. It's offensive, but it's funny, and it's a spoof of things that have gone before. All this uh, Satan shit that, that uh, Grohl is spewing out here... It really doesn't strike you as being particularly uh, 
strong effort at being funny. There are ways that you could write this stuff where it wouldn't be just a blank reiteration of the sorts of things that uh, have been in these songs for many decades in this genre. Grohl didn't go there. And, you know, I haven't seen the entirety of the uh, Studio 666 film, but, oh my gosh, is it horrible. You know, Hawkins is actually uh, decapitated by Grohl, flings uh, a big symbol at him, a very large symbol, and uh, decapitates him straight through the uh, oral cavity, nailing him to a wall. It's that kind of a movie. Now, that may not even be the most horrific uh, death of the bandmates uh, that is depicted. So, uh, gee whiz, didn't he see a problem here? Didn't he see the potential that there was going to be a feud or uh, some sort of splitting off between himself and uh, especially Taylor Hawkins, who seemed to want to branch out into one of his many side projects on a more regular basis? If there's any truth at all to any of these claims by these many persons that are supposedly close to Hawkins, not only for uh, monetary gain, but also artistic credibility, which in many ways Taylor Hawkins seemed to be pursuing. Anyway, that's it for number three. We'll be back with number four. The time is 4.57. So, 4.28 p.m., 29th of October, 2022. And this will be number four. 